for thousands of years. People have searched for the secrets of taking their spiritual life to new levels of depth and effectiveness. Is it education or tradition? Solitude or service? Devotion or demonstration? The question is still asked, and many still search for the answers. For the next 30 minutes, Jack Hayford offers you an unusual journey into the realm of the Holy Spirit, an invitation to be Spirit-born, Spirit-fed, Spirit-filled, and Spirit-formed. Welcome to the next stage of your spiritual life, Spirit-formed with Jack Hayford. Hello again, and welcome to Spirit-formed. I want to go directly to our teaching, continuing, not where I left off, but continuing with the second part of a series of studies that I began last week and a series that we will find completeness in today's session so it isn't something dependent upon what you've heard before. I've been talking about prevailing prayer, talking about prayer that wins the day, seeking to avoid the notion that there's such a thing as a magic formula that you learn how to quote phrases, incantations, it actually can be very sincerely put, even in our traditions as spirit-filled people who live according to the scriptures and want to glorify Jesus Christ, we can fall prey to our own order of superstition that's wrapped up so many times in thinking, if I can just find the magic way to put this, and there's a giveaway, the word magic, and there is nothing about spiritual life that is magic, nothing that is contrived, nothing that is smoke and mirrors. It all has to do with solid, pragmatic reality. It's the reason we call the broadcast spirit formed, because there is a shape of things that take literal shape. It is not some kind of phantom spirit formed. It's not some kind of bizarre, excitable spirituality, as exciting as our life in Christ is, that is dependent upon the hoopla, or just, let's put it in the most positive frame, dependent upon a joyous, liberated praise service. I don't become dependent on those things I enjoy in that environment, but I find a pattern that I am shaped and fashioned by the Holy Spirit of God so that my spirit, my inner man, becomes shaped by His Spirit, the Spirit of God. leaders. During times of questions, they provide vision. During times of transition, they provide stability. And during times of crisis, they provide hope. The King's College and Seminary founder, Chancellor Jack Hayford, understands the importance of building leaders. Our vision for the future includes a school of worship, a school for urban ministry, a broadening of our scholarship program, so that all students have an opportunity for training regardless of their financial situation. And building the King's Library, a 60,000 square foot resource center. Become a part of this incredible movement toward equipping the leaders of tomorrow and experience the excitement and fulfillment of seeing churches changed, ministries energized, and lives transformed through the impact of Holy Spirit-formed leadership. The King's College and Seminary, building leaders touching the world. As we open the scriptures today, we're discussing how that shaping of our understanding will help us to be more effective in prayer and thereby prevail. Defining prevailing prayer is what I've called this series, or winning the day, prayer that wins the day. But it doesn't win through our achievement. It's because we've gotten on the right team. The captain of the team, you know his name, Jesus. And when we move in partnership with him, the companionship, and go into the battle, that prayer will win the day. It's an amazing thing because we often think, well, if he is our Lord and Master, why doesn't he just take care of everything like that? And for an astounding and sometimes almost mysterious, but nonetheless very clear reason, mysterious in that he doesn't need to do it this way, but very clear in that he says it's the way I'm going to do it. He wants us to partner with him. He wants us in the mix where he could just say, don't bother to pray, I'll just take care of everything and I'll pave the way. And he does pave the way. 
but he paves the way when we pray the way. And there's something about that blend and partnership that is an inescapable part of believing life in Jesus Christ. I want to talk about the basic idea that Jesus has about prayer. And the basic idea is wrapped up in his basic idea for his people. Now, the Bible uses the term church to describe his people. It's church as people who have been called unto him. The word church in the original language, as many of you know already, ecclesia, means people that are called out, out of where we are, unto him, out of pointlessness to a purpose, out of our lostness to become one of the found ones, out of our sin into his salvation, out of futility into fulfillment. <laughs> called out unto him. But I want to talk about that word in a more explicit sense that I think helps us understand really what Jesus had in mind. Because there's no question those things I just said are true. And that is commonly the way that the word ecclesia is discussed by we who teach and preach the word of God. And it is true. We usually teach that the called out ones, let me just take a moment, the Ecclesia, or we use the word ecclesiastical. That word in English is derived from ecclesia, the Greek word for church, the church. And the ek is the Greek preposition out. The ecclesia is from the verb kaleo, which is to be called out. And so the called out ones are the ones that have heard the Savior say, Come unto me, all of you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. It's the one that says, come unto me. He says, have you drunk too long at the dry cisterns so that your mouth is filled with dust and you crave the living water? I'll give you water and it will spring up in you unto eternal life. And as he calls us to himself, we come and we find the joy of a beginning. But that beginning is intended unto a growing. And so he who calls us unto himself says, now follow me. And as we follow him, we come to a place and a way of life that is the way of the disciple, the way of being spirit-formed. In that walk, we begin to experience what Jesus had in mind when he said one day to his disciples in a very significant conversation, he said, I will build my church. Now, I believe in church buildings, and so don't misunderstand me. In fact, I've been involved in building a number of, in my time as a pastor, and it is worthy and proper. I will, don't want to take time on this, but every once in a while you'll find some purist who says, well, the church isn't really buildings. Well, it's true. It's people. The church, as we'll see more than ever in what I'm about to say, the church is the people of God. But for a church to have a building is no less holy or less purposeful than a family to have a house. And the church is a local family, a part of the family of God, which we're also called. And the Lord directed the building of the tabernacle in the Old Testament, the building of the temple. God is not opposed to dwellings for his people. So let's let that be done with it. But I always feel the need to say something in behalf of dear fellow pastors who, having a building program, will have somebody say, well, I just don't know that it's important to have buildings. We're, in fact, right now acquiring a building for the King's Seminary where we will train people. And I'm reminded of Elijah taking those, Elisha, with the young men who went out to gather the wood and to cut the trees to build a place for the school that they were going to have the school of the prophets. Well, that's what our seminary is, a school of prophets. And as we're engaged in that, I cannot properly make an appeal for that now in the middle of this broadcast. But there is something about pastors when they ask for people to support what is being built that uh, there will be someone who will say, well, I just don't put my money in buildings. I believe in people. And it sounds so godly, but uh, they base it on, I will build my church. And the church isn't a building, it's people. And I always want to just say, oh, good for you that you understood that. Now, what was Jesus saying? Well, while he wasn't knocking the idea of us having buildings for the work of God, he was talking about people, but he was talking about it in a specific way. And that's what I want to take several minutes with. Because at the heart of it 
is a point of understanding that if we can lay hold of that, it will help us understand that prevailing prayer has to do with laying hold of issues larger than we often think. I say often think with, within our purview or privilege. Larger than we often think is, well, you know, I'm just plain me. I'm a fairly ordinary person. But the Lord calls us unto such dimensions of prayer that he says, if you will intercede and pray as I call you, I'll shape the climate of your society, of your neighborhood. I'll shape the nature of things in the government of your city, not because you won an election, not because you put your man in office, but because you prayed, and because I began to penetrate the darkness because my people invoked the presence of the light. There is a self-righteousness in the supposition that the only way to find an ascendancy of righteousness is for somehow the religious or the believing to possess control. The Bible does say that a city is blessed when righteous people are in government. So that's not an argument against that. But we live in a society right now that has a certain fear that if Christians took over, well, we'd start killing the unrighteous. And that's whether that's anything legitimate or not it's, isn't the issue. It's if it's perceived as such. It's a misunderstanding of who we are and what we're about. One thing we can do and are called to do is to recognize the dimensions at which we have been authorized to pray. And when Jesus said, I will build my church, he was touching on that. Let me talk about that. When Jesus said, I will build my church, it is unquestionable that he would have used the Greek term. Now, some scholars watching right now know that in the New Testament times, Jesus was speaking in Aramaic, and that the Gospels written in the uh, Greek language were written in the broad, sweeping language of the time for reasons of communication, but it wasn't necessarily always the way it was spoken. But in this case, there is no question, because the word was born from the Greek culture, and Jesus was communicating this idea. And that uh, the scripture uses it in Matthew's words. Jesus said, I will build my church. Even if he said everything into that point in the language of the immediate culture at that time, Aramaic. If he did that, he would have used ecclesia because it was the word, the one word that described what he was talking about. There was no other of its time. The word ecclesia came into usage in a unique way about 500 years before Christ, but it was common in the currency of the times of his ministry and understood this way. It was a word that described uh, the introduction that had taken place centuries before that time of a new way of governing people until about the 4th or 5th century B.C. The rule of people everywhere was governed by a king on a throne or some kind of a tribal leader, a chieftain, who from the head on down, people did what was said by the, if you will, boss, the jefe. And so this occasion of the introduction of the ecclesia took place in ancient Athens, first of all. And it took place when the people of the city, in tandem with their overseeing, the monarch, the the overseeing king, shall we say, of that city-state of Athens said, I want to see a partnership of the people in the governance of our city and all its affairs. And it was something that was not done by vote. It was something done by the choice of the leader. He said, I want to see the government conducted, the decisions made by the people. And so they began what we would call today town meetings, the town meetings took place at a specific site. Let me tell you about it. It may be of interest to you. All of us, I suppose, a year and a half, two years ago, remember seeing the, uh, that season's Olympic Games in process, and they were in ancient Athens. And so none of us, I'm sure, at least at that time, uh, failed to have at least one occasion when rolling there across our uh, television screen 
was a scene of the ancient high place, the Acropolis of Athens. That's where that majestic structure called the Parthenon is located. It's symbolic of the ancient world, certainly of ancient Greece. And the Parthenon is a site that I visited a number of times over the years. And in that area, you can come down from that highest place. Acropolis means the high city. From that ancient high place and walk down till you come to an area that is near a little knob of hill called Mars Hill. That's where the Apostle Paul preached the message that's recorded in Acts chapter 17. From there, if you step and look, probably three or four hundred yards over to the west, there's a flat jutting out of rock, probably a hundred, hundred and fifty yards long, jutting out perhaps as much as, oh, maybe 40 to 50 yards. All of this is in the high place area up above the ancient Agora, which is located down below the high, the high part of the, the ancient city, the ancient marketplace down there, the area where people of ancient Athens lived, where they worked. And this was the place where they came up for discussion, schooling, for philosophy lessons, where they would come for their ancient worship. And now, at the time of the formation of the ecclesia, it's where they came to do business as a people. The Panix is the name of that outcropping of rock that is there to the west. And people would be called to the town meeting. They'd be called to come out of where they live, out of the Agora, out of the marketplace where they were, and to ascend to the Panix where they would gather for interaction, for discussion. And the head of state until that time said, folks, you're going to manage this. And they would begin to discuss how would they determine what would take place in the climate of their culture? How would they determine how they would school their children? How would they determine handling the budget affairs of the city? Who would they appoint to oversee different matters at hand? How would they handle preparing for battle or warfare if there came the advance of another people? All the issues that they faced as a people were decided as they together received what was conferred upon them by their leader. And as they made the decisions how the city, how the nation would move forward, it was made as the result of their acceptance of their place as members of the population who were more than just the payons, more than just, well, this is just where I live, but the people who had answered the call as the ecclesia the ones called to the place of making decisions as to what will take shape in the future of their own world. Jesus said, I'm going to build a people like that. A people who recognize that their world, whether it's the world of their family, their neighborhood, their community, the world of their city, state, or nation, the world of the realm in which they are facing their present circumstances, whether those things will be dominated by either the forces of things that are or the tyrannical works of the powers of darkness, the prince of the power of the air, or the overruling spirit of the world, that those things that would oppress, the things of our own weakness or limitation, will I be dominated by those things or will I accept what has been given me by Jesus? When he said, I'll give the keys of the kingdom, he was saying, I'm giving you access to the authority that gives you a partnership with what determines if the kingdom of God's rule will enter your world or if things will continue to prevail as they are in your world. And the power, the possibilities of prevailing prayer have to do with people who come to recognize that circumstances that appear to us to have a dominion that we're tempted to give in to, to feel, well, this is, just, this is just too much. I can't handle any more. That at that point, we hear a whisper in our heart, a whisper of the Lord saying, you are my church. You're one of mine. Come out from the midst of that and come into my presence and there begin to call upon me 
for I am going to give you the keys of the kingdom of God. And listen to this. He said, and the gates or the councils of hell shall not prevail. They will not prevail because there is a prevailing possibility in what is given to you. But it will never take place, loved ones, if we live in that passive stance that a kind of almost Christian fatalism exists of saying, well, these, you know, just que sera, sera. I guess this must be the way that God wants things to be. When in fact, dear ones, so much in our world is not even approximate to what he wills. How many times will people take prophecies of the end times and look at the world in the corruption that besets us and the agonies of the hour and say, well, the Lord said it was going to be this way. And it is that way. But he didn't say it has to stay that way where his people are. they are people that are lost. And he didn't say, well, they're lost, so they'll just have to stay that way. He's given us the privilege of coming with the good news of the love of God in Jesus Christ with the mercy of the Lord that brings salvation, to come not with a religious pretense, but to come and embrace the world in its pain and need and to reach with love. And then beyond human touch, the things that are being splayed, destroyed, exploded apart by reason of the animosities of hell, by reason of circumstances that crush people, that we look at them and say, what can I do about those? You can answer the call. Come up to the Penix. Come up to that place. For now the Penix in ancient Athens calls us to another place, to the high place, to the high place of the presence of God, where the scripture says, we have been seated in the heavenlies and in Christ. And there in Christ to take our place. And as we do, begin to call out to the Lord and to say, Lord, I come to exercise the privileged role that I am given. He said then, for it is those who do that, who are my church, who take the keys. Hell shall not prevail. And he says, for this reason, for whatever you release into earth, as already is releasable in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed, in, has already been loosed in heaven you're appropriating what is done through the cross and provided by the promise of God. What has been written in the word said, this is yours and this is for those that you touch and for the world in which you are. Say, Lord, what you have spoken, what is your will, let it come and be done on earth. Say, couldn't God just do it anyway? Well, of course he could. John Wesley put it so well, though, centuries ago. He said, the question is not, can God do it on his own? The question is, what has been his will? Contrary to popular belief, the bad things that happen aren't the will of God. You say, well, why do they happen? Because we live in a broken world and, in many respects, a demon-managed one in many circumstances. And the Lord said, but I have a church in the middle of it. And if they'll hear my call, they can take their place. And as they do, there will not be a prevailing of the works of darkness. There will be an inflow of the kingdom because what I do will is to will that they would call upon me and I will show them great and mighty things. Call upon me and what heaven designs can enter into the earth scene. So Wesley said, without him, we can't get a result. We cannot. But without us, he won't. Not because he's heartless, but because he's committed to growing a people who will learn the way the power of God will prevail on earth is through a praying church and a ministering people who love a broken world and take their place in prayer. And so, prevailing prayer takes place where people understand who we've been called to be in Christ and through Christ. And by taking that place, to watch what only God can do. But he has said, I do it as only I can, but I only do it when you call. You may have been watching this broadcast today and you've never called on the Lord concerning a circumstance. He's ready to enter with heavenly grace, to move what heaven wants 
into a place where hell is making your present moment. You may, have never, you may never have received the Lord. And he won't save you on your own, but he will save you if you call on your own and say, Lord, come be my Savior. Whatever it is, the circumstances we face or the salvation we need, call upon the Lord today with me. Father, I pray for these who join me now and in Jesus' name say, come. Just as we come to you, to the right hand of the throne of God through Jesus Christ our Lord, let there come a flow of your life, Lord. We praise you for your greatness, your almightiness, and thank you that it's at our disposal through no strength of ours, but because we come to the fountain of life and we say, let your kingdom come, your will be done in me, in my family, in my town, on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen. God's presence is becoming manifest among those who worship Him in humility and with passion. Learn how you can make room for the King in Jack Hayford's new book, Manifest Presence. In this anointed study of God's Word, Pastor Jack reveals how we can expect a visitation of God's grace through worship. Manifest Presence is available for your gift of $30 or more. Join Pastor Jack in discovering the privilege of worshiping the Lord and the promise it holds for calling your hopes and dreams into life. Impact. Leaders create an impact, changing the lives of millions, transforming nations, and directing the course of history. Chancellor Jack Hayford and the King's College and Seminary are committed to training leaders to make a difference on the global stage. Men and women who understand biblical principles are led by the Holy Spirit and are ready to answer the challenges of this generation. If average isn't for you, then it's time to rise to the occasion of real leadership. Leadership with vision, direction, and purpose. And if you'd like to help train those leaders, call the number on the screen and find out how your financial gift can make a dramatic difference. When was the last time you had the opportunity to impact a generation? At the King's College and Seminary, Chancellor Jack Hayford and a remarkable faculty are training a new generation of leaders that will impact this culture with a message of hope. How do you measure impact? Through the training of leaders. We're ready. Are you? We'd like to invite you to partner with us as we continue to take Spirit Formed with Jack Hayford to an ever-increasing audience. Your prayers and financial partnership are critical in allowing us to expand this teaching ministry throughout the world. And when you call, we'll send you a complimentary copy of our ministry magazine, Spectrum. It's filled with insights, information, and practical advice for deepening your Christian walk. If you've enjoyed today's program, we encourage you to call, and for only $5, we'll send you an audio cassette of this important teaching. When you call, ask for our catalog of books, tapes, and other resources that can make a dramatic difference in your Christian life. And if you'd like information on the King's College and Seminary, let us know, and we'll rush that out right away. Just call the number on your screen, or check our website at jackhayford.com. Join us again next week as we continue the journey to becoming Spirit Form with Jack Hayford.